Greetings, parish orphans of retrogrades. Happy Saturday and welcome back to Rules for Retrogrades. It's been a little bit of a layoff and I've been all over the US in an RV with a fam. Our first show Greetings back. Parish orphans of retrogrades. Sorry. Happy Saturday and welcome oh, back sorry. to Rules for Retrogrades. It's been a little bit of a layoff and I've Sorry about that. There, sorry about that. So, <laughs> some technical glitches. Our, our first show back is what you're about to watch. And what you're about to watch is, I, I think, something, something new, something needed, something that will fill a niche, as we were just talking right now. I've got with me three manly gents who are also Catholics, who are committed to a project with me that we call Christian Masculinism. And it is literally, according to our estimation, and maybe in, over the course of a show, we can convince you, I think maybe your estimation as well, the only way to save Christendom, the only way to save Christendom is via virtuous male leadership in families. It's the only way. And it's a layman's way. And we're going to talk about this as we go along. With me today, in no certain order, are my friend Will Noland who, like me, is a father of seven. Um, he was, like me, fired from a private school on that side of the pond for speaking the truth. And he was fired for more or less speaking the truth about Christian masculinism. My other friend is Dr. Michael Robillard, who co-authored Don't Go to College with me. He's the author of one other book on, on military and philosophy. He's been to places like Oxford and Notre Dame and postdoc. He's an army ranger. He's an all around good dude. Michael Robillard, thank you for being with us here today. And finally, Elliot Hulse. I just went in the order in which we appeared on the Zoom link. Elliot is known as a Catholic strongman and a strongman more broadly on the internet. Elliot's a very, very good man. He's appeared on this channel. I've appeared on his channel. and. He's got a lot to offer young men out there who have been beguiled by those somewhere on the hoary de facto right wing, young men who are disenchanted and disenfranchised, feeling disconnected from society because the left disconnected them, on, on, particularly on the red-pilled manosphere. And all four of us are going to be talking to points relevant to the red-pilled manosphere today. Will, Will, first, you just announced, uh, by way of unpacking what the patriarchy is, you're, you're having your seventh kid or your wife's going to soon. God bless you, man. Thanks, yeah. It's a, a blessing. I can remember early 20s, people thinking I was crazy for having three kids. And now here I am, mid-30s, with seven on the way. But that's what it's all about, ultimately be fruitful and multiply and procreate, protect, provide. Those are the pillars of manhood in natural terms. Christianity has got a lot to add to it, but this is how it's done. Yeah, this is, this is how it's done. Um, we did a, a last show. I, I wanted to get you guys each in here for, for an introductory word first, but me, Michael and Will, we did a kind of dry run at this on my channel a little bit ago. And of course, the way this is going to work is we're going to rotate between each of our four channels and we're going to do it quite often, like up to once a week. So these will be the Christian masculinism shows, C-Mask. And what we found out when we did that, Michael, is that folks had this broader question. Are, are you guys LARPing? Are you saying there's some return to a, an imagined way we never were whereby... Uh, men just run society, and if I see a, a woman on the street, I could say, clear out, I, I'm, I'm coming through. Is that what patriarchy is? I think Will gave the answer last time. No, patriarchy means rule, rule by fathers. Um, people were asking this question. I think we need to unpack it some on this first show as we respond to those on the manosphere like Andrew Tate who are, who are getting enough wrong to warrant correction. So uh, uh, my, I don't know if Michael, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, the, the broader question picking up from last time is 
outside the domain of marriage, what ought to be the, the etiquettal norms or, or what, what semblance of etiquettal norms in, in this sort of fractured, <laughs> fractured civilization that we have, does that look like between men and women? Uh, does it, you know, does it look like Islam? Does it look like a, a com complete free for all or is it somewhere in between? What, what do those etiquettal, etiquettal norms look like based upon catechesis and just, just good common sense? Right, because uh, Elliot, you know this. We were talking about this when you appeared on my show at first. We're always accused of wanting to bring something that looks a little bit gnarly like Islam when we're just like, you know, this is how Western civilization was built, right? Uh, on, on the patriarchy. It's, it wasn't Islam that built the West. So why is that always what, what guys like us get accused of? Well, I think it's because they're actually practicing their faith and most of us have for forgotten ours. And when it comes to what would be required, of course, maybe we can go in reverse order and we'll end up where we started, which is with the Catholic faith. But at least men are beginning to think about virtue. And maybe they'll start with the most appeasing or easy virtues like courage, right? And protection and providing. But then chastity as a virtue for a man who's not married is exemplary of a type of strength that I think the red pill community is just not aware of. Yes. Yeah. We, I mean, it's, it's the Rocky one virtue, right? It's, it's, you know, women weaken legs. This doesn't necessarily apply to, to married men, but the boxers virtue of chastity will be accepted, I guess, by even the red pill community, Elliot, like you point out when there's a, a match or a game, that it's done under the, the heading of, but it, it's never more broadly accepted writ large. And, and since we're talking about Islam, since Andrew Tate has made some interesting remarks about Islam, um, that we should talk some uh, uh, about that. Islam's a little bit vague on the question as to overall male celibacy. Is, is that a good thing? Female celibacy is it, obviously in all cultures that aren't completely insane valued but i don't know where um islam is on it e e elliot what do you say about what do you say about the the red pill guys because there are a lot of these guys that admire you and have been admirers of you for a long time that probably cross over into andrew tate's community what do you say about what he said about islam that look at least it's respected man you can't walk down certain parts of paris or london and diss Islam, but you can do that to Christianity. And that's why we're a joke with young men, so, something like that. Yeah, and it stings because it rings with a lot of truth. Uh, you can say whatever you want. In fact, I recently heard that open hatred towards Catholicism is the last acceptable form of bigotry. And so you can do it and be praised for it. But to say even the name Muhammad without a PBH after it will get you slapped and maybe deheaded. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that that's where we got to go, but I'm pretty sure there was a time not too long ago where we couldn't or the world couldn't be so openly aggressive and antithesis to our faith either. Where has that gone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I mean, I, and I, don't, I don't have to be the one directing all the questions here. You guys feel free to jump in. But I will say this. If you, if you misspeak the, the prophet, you know, if you misspeak his name without saying blessed be upon him and, and doing all of the <laughs> right. ritual hand washing, it's funny to watch secular liberals who make fun of every other religion do. They, 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 they kiss ass there where they need to because they don't want to get beheaded. I'm not saying that's necessarily the way as a distinction of degree, but as a distinction of kind, it's not a bad way to have your religion regarded throughout the world. I'm not sure how, how, how helpful it is evangelically, but they, they seem to be getting a lot of converts in certain parts of the Pacific Southwest. They're getting converts in Europe and it's attractive to young men. So the first rule I think, we don't, we don't even just have to talk about how this affected Catholicism because we're talking about the broader culture, but 
for a moment inside Catholicism, just like Elliot pointed out, uh, me, well, me and you were talking about this. Young men are not going to practice a religion that they don't respect, right? And that's, that's a big part of the problem over the last 60, 70 years in Catholicism is the church has been run by women. women. We're talking about the chanceries, the parish schools, uh, all of the, the parish life in general. It's, it's directed by women. Even though there still is this titular clerical patriarchy, the, the simultaneous lay patriarchy just fell. And when young men don't follow a religion, then the young women won't do it with any seriousness either. And they'll be surrogating as leaders where they should be followers. And even then they don't do it with a seriousness of purpose. One way of looking at the last 70 years in the Roman Catholic church is men don't do it, women do it. I think a deeper way of looking at it is if we're talking about with any seriousness, men don't practice it. Women don't seriously practice it either. The women go through the motions of parish life and school life. They work at the chanceries, but they're doing it badly too, because they can't lead e even spiritually here. So what do you say about post-feminism life in Christendom? Yeah, I think the comparison with Islam is a powerful one, but we need to stress that it's not that Christianity is somehow feminine by nature and Islam is masculine by nature. Christianity too is patriarchy at its core. And it's the failure to practice Christianity properly that has led to this. It's not that Christianity in its doctrine is feminist in any way. Yeah, that's key. I had on my show a young filmmaker, I think it was the last show before I went to this little layoff break that I've been on for the last week and a half, traveling all over the Eastern seaboard, going to Disney World. Um, and yeah, his name is Nick. And Nick is coming back into the faith. He was raised, unlike a lot of us, he was raised in the Latin Mass and in uh, Byzantine Rite as well. He was by ritual and in the best sense of the term. And he still fell away. And I said, as a trad, so when they goes to TLM, I'm a TLM supremacist. I've always kind of figured, and most of the trads figure, oh, I fell away strictly because I was raised in the Novus Ordo church. And it turns out that that's only right by being a part and parcel of the broader feminist takeover of the church in the world. And because of that broader feminist takeover, in other words, we have the Latin mass because the church went feminist. The church didn't go feminist because we have the Latin mass. That's an important distinction, I think, from, from my channel to, to be making. But um, you're absolutely right, Will. When I had Nick on the show, he had a couple basic questions for me. He's like, I grew up thinking Jesus was effeminate. And he wasn't trying to be disrespectful. Shia LaBeouf said the exact same thing. And I said, no, he, here's how he's not. I answered a couple basic questions. He's like, that would have kept me from falling away. The, the two or three answers you were able to give right off the cuff, proving how masculine the church is. I, I mean, the church is a bride, but, but proving how the dominion over the church by Christ is masculine. And that's what our, where we're getting our signpostings from. That would have kept all the young men in the church. Same thing with the Latin mass over Nova Sordo. So Michael, I took you to a, to a Latin mass, I think. And uh, you said, I feel like I've been stripped of my, my birthright. You'd, you'd never been to one. We went to St. Pat's in New Orleans. And I think people need to wake up to the broader reality that their birthright is patriarchy, and they're not getting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, I think I was, what, 41 going to my first TLM. I, I, I never knew it existed. It was just like... Oh, that's that's the real thing. That's what this ought to look like. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, everything else had been a, a sketch. You know, it had been a, a, a shadows in Plato's cave prior to that. Um, so that that was yeah, transformative being able to see that sort of in in its full full correct form. Um, I still think I still think eating away at the Western mind, though, it's it, I, I brought this up last time. It's this tension between traditional Aristotelianism 
and classical liberalism because the the the, the form of Christianity it is that of natural hierarchy natural social hierarchy is going to be in tension with a broad egalitarian like equal rights framework so then the average western man you go so you're an american right you believe in equal rights feminism just as equal rights and 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 now the martin bailey the 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 ratchet sets in and now you're you're just pinned underneath that trying to reconcile those things so i think for me anyways as somebody who swore an oath to to defend this social project i'm very much in conflict as to how to reconcile those things being christian and being american being catholic and being american you know how how do you and to be a man managing those things how how do those things reconcile yeah that, so that's that's the real red pill gents is is this notion of and that, that's why i was analogizing to feeling red pilled when you go to like a latin mass for the first time it's that times 10 when you realize that christianity is a bifurcated patriarchy the clerical patriarchy we've got so many problems with the bishops so many <laughs> they're effeminate for one thing that some of them are homosexuals uh for another thing but the lay patriarchy is what can save the world that's what that's what the title of this first show is on christian masculinism and it's absolutely real and that's a red pill that even a bunch of folks that have been in a minor way red pilled liturgically oh go to the latin mass when you can not Novus Ordo. totally true it's 10 times a bigger red pill, even for those trads to realize that you're not traditional at all unless you eschew egalitarianism. Like Michael's saying, I'm looking for this, this uh, uh, conversation that Michael and I had on, on text where we were talking about, this is, this is what you said. I think it's, it's really, really good. It's like a, it's like a three-part maneuver. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, Christianity entails natural social hierarchy between the sexes, in lots of ways, even between classes, between the Pope and the bishops and the priests and the laity, right? So Christianity entails natural social hierarchy. Number two, progressivism entails a telos, uh, an end goal by nature, of never-ending social egalitarianism whereby progressives demonize any non-egalitarian positions by labeling opponents as witches by means of some sort of bad name, you know, some sort of ism, some sort of phobia that, that left is always making up. You're, you're a blank phobe, a, a bigot, whatever. And thirdly, they twist the knife by saying conservatives, but by having conservatives endlessly stumble all over themselves to explain to the left why, in fact, they're not these witches. It, it works really well. Michael, when you wrote that, I thought, this is ingenious. This is how feminism got inside everything, including the church. Most, uh, most women don't call themselves feminists anymore. They did in the 1970s, more than half. So people will say, it died. No, it preponderated. They literally infected the host organism. Now people are feminists. Trads are feminists. They don't even know. And why? Because they're unwilling to wriggle out of that Mott and Bailey hold, Michael, mm -hmm. where people go, well, aren't you an egalitarian? Don't you believe in equal rights? I believe in equal dignity between men and women. I don't believe in absolutely equal rights. Isn't that what you're saying? Yeah, I think that necessarily falls out of, of Catholic doctrine. It does. Yeah. Now, well, I mean, I'm the one that I could, I could prove it. I got a book called The Case for Patriarchy. I don't, I don't know what will... You and uh, you and Elliot think about this, but I mean, this is uh, we print it off. We're giving this to our patrons. It's called feminism versus Catholicism. Just the sources. This is just teachings in the Bible and um, by popes and encyclicals and things like that that prove what Michael said that we don't believe in egalitarianism uh, outside of the the view of God. We have equal worth in God's eyes, men and women, but, but here on earth, men are to be in charge, especially within the confine of family. So I, I don't know how many of the people that you guys know, well, how many people that you've ever met know this, even conservatives? Very few. And 
the idea that a wife should submit to her husband is one that in modern culture is deeply offensive. And to be frank, I'm not sure even most men really want the burden of that kind of leadership and responsibility because trad wife means trad life. And that means you don't expect your wife to work. You don't expect her to have to pay for her house, her car, her clothing. It's all on you. And when you scratch the surface, many men actually are feminist, Tim, just like you say, they just don't realize it. And that's why I think on the deepest level, Feminism is fundamentally a failure of male leadership. And it's something that men craved. That's what free love was all about. You can get easy sex without the duty, without responsibility of family. And in that sense, it was a honey trap. And you've got all these guys now railing against feminism, complaining about it like it was imposed on them when really they craved it. And it will be very difficult for them to give it up. Amen. Can you use it? Can you unpack that for a second, Will? Trad wife equals trad life. And why your average Andrew Tate viewer, who might be 22 or 23, is intimidated away from claiming his birthright, which is to find some sort of trad wife because he doesn't want to live a trad life. Is that what you're saying? Well, let's just use Tate as an example. So the idea here is that somehow monogamy is bad and they even go beyond just multiple wives and say promiscuity is somehow natural it's a good thing so you get the high value male who gets a harem basically except the difference now is that unlike for an old testament king for example he's not actually married to them he just has lots of girls that he texts and hooks up with and maybe he uses contraception too, almost certainly does. If not, maybe abortion's a big part of his life. And this is because he doesn't actually want the responsibility of what an actual Old Testament patriarch with many wives would have had, which is protecting all of them, providing for all of them, the duties as a father. So it's an attempt to get all the easy benefits, all the pleasure without the responsibility, because yeah, being a father does come with authority, but that also comes with a heavy burden to bear. And that's why free love came at the cost, really, of men becoming boys. Can I add a point to that, Will? Yeah. In the So, yeah, these same folks, I've been guilty of this in, in my past as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely uh, not, not claiming to be fully innocent of this. But within that community they'll have that ethic, but then the, the very next thing out of their mouth will be like, well, oh, you know, damn the, damn the, the, the nanny state. Uh, what about, you know, uh, my, my freedoms of, of and uh, resistance against being censored and whatnot. Um, and it turns out that their behaviors are actually, fe- they're, they're, they're withering away at the family, the very bulwark against the tyrannical nanny state. Mm-hmm. So there's a Chechen quote I just pulled up. It's uh, free love is the direct enemy of freedom. It is the most obvious of all the bribes that can be offered by slavery. Right. So, I mean, it's this, you know, right. I mean, like that really hits it on the head where it's just like if performatively you're pushing promiscuity. And then secondly, it's like, oh, damn, the state taking away my freedoms. It's like the family is the, that's the, that's your defense against the damn nanny state. Not, not. The, um, so you can't have you can't have you can't have it both ways. Elliot, you're you, in some ways, by virtue of um, audience, at least you're mm-hmm. you're sort of the closest to this. What do you think? What would what would your audience think if they heard Will say Will or Michael say basically that what Andrew Tate is preaching is a kind of controlled op version of of feminism that actually through, through the G.K. Chesterton quote that Mike just read, really, they're, they're a useful piece. They're part of the problem. They ain't part of the solution. Yeah, it's great to hear Andrew Tate say why feminism is bad. That scratches an itch for me, too. Mm-hmm. But, but what would your people say if, if they heard Andrew Tate's really giving in to feminism? He's, he's preaching a certain kind of modified feminism. 
Mm -hmm. Well, we'll find out after I upload this on my channel, but if I had to take a guess, they would all be very much aligned with what you guys are saying because they're a logical bunch. What you're saying isn't ideological. What you're saying is biological. It's scientific. It's rational. It only makes sense. The only now, of course, we live this life or we believe this. So there's confirmation bias. I married my high school girlfriend. So I'm saying, yes, do this, guys. So maybe coming from me, it doesn't make as much sense. But if you just look at it in terms of, well, now I get to give up my confirmation bias of seeking vaginal validation through chasing pussy. Uh, I will now be able to see clearly that what you're saying just makes perfect sense. You can't, it's hard to refute what you're saying. And especially because if you look at the fruits, you know that what we're doing is not working. In fact, this week, uh, I, this weekend, I actually took a break to come back here with you guys. The reason why I did, wasn't able to make it yesterday is because I'm speaking at the 21 convention. I've been doing so for the past five years and it's, a, it's the Red Pill Manosphere event, you know, par excellence. And I was asked to give a speech to women. You know, so there's a part of the event that's where men come and speak to women. My entire talk was on Mary. And I propose, and I'm proposing to you guys that feminism perhaps started to get its momentum with the Protestant Reformation of, in some way, like with the, with, the, with the throwing of the baby out with the bathwater went Mary. And with Mary went the perfect example of not just what a woman could be, should be, and uh, would be called to emulate, but for a man to see as the ideal woman to uh, want. Think of all the art, think of all the architecture, think of all the music and poetry and devotion to Mary that made Western culture beautiful. To a virgin, these men gave their allegiance. With the effacing of Mary, with the defacement of Mary, with the getting her out of the way, we allowed both men and women to say, well, maybe there's a different kind of archetype for men to seek and women and women to live up to. I know in many of these apparitions and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the greatest uh, Catholic scholar here, but it seems as if Mary keeps saying, you got to come back to me. Christ is there, of course. She doesn't replace Christ. There's, she brings us Christ. But she keeps calling us back to her, to her. And she gets the most vitriol. It seems almost as if there's more of an anti-Mary than there is an anti-Christ in our world today. It's because it's mostly coming from the Christians, the other Christians. They don't like to hear this. It was yesterday in my talk, and it'll be on YouTube, and hopefully it gets some traction that if we're going to make a comeback, it can't, listen, it's up to us as men, but... Are we praying the rosary? Are we venerating Mary? Are we showing her as an example of the type of women that we want to be with, virgins, uh, and as an example for our daughters? It's beautiful. Yeah, and, and there's there's a lot to back up what you're saying. Um, inside and outside of the Marian model, Elliot, just th that you used, that feminism started with the Protestants. I show it in... Um, case for patriarchy the first wave feminists of the 1800s also knew that they had to respond to scripture and so they tended to be left-leaning scriptural protestants were all, all most of them i'd say 80 percent of the first wave feminists so there's there's lots to that and like you say the image of mary haunts western civilization this is the ideal woman the ideal man is is jesus her son and there's this traditional Old Testament model of the king and his mother as mm -hmm. queen that I didn't even know about until recently. Jesus, ideal man, Mary, ideal woman. Well, in the post-Reformation West, Mary's been taken down. So who is that primary woman? And a lot of, and then Jesus has been feminized. So there is no ideal man. He's utterly masculine. <laughs> Mary's utterly feminine. A lot of folks got mad at me about a year ago, because on Twitter, I said, Mary never evangelized. She wouldn't. That's a male thing. Preaching the gospel is a male thing. Going out into the world, into dangerous places is a male thing. Uh, contra Marvel, Marvel movies with all these uh, heroines. So you're absolutely right. You're 100% right. By outstripping, Mary is the ideal woman. Jesus is the ideal man. Women have become less effeminate. 
and men have become less masculine. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Christianity is the key to being absolutely a masculine male without going too far, without lopping people's mm -hmm. heads off. Elliot, mm -hmm. what you just said reminded me of this great quote from William Lecky. He's an atheist, and he wrote The History of European Morals. And he says that the transition from paganism to Christianity vastly improved the status of women for a few reasons. He says, one, absolute prohibition of sexual indulgence outside marriage. In a way, Christianity was the real sexual revolution because it controlled male mm. sexual behavior as well as female. Second point, he says, security of wives by the prohibition of divorce. Third point, legal rights of guardianship of children, hitherto reserved only for men. Fourth, inheritance of widows. And we could also extend his list to include things like separate prison cells for men and women. Christians were the first to do that. No separate baptism for men and women. Christians didn't expose baby girls at birth like they did in some of the ancient Greek cultures, for example. And Christians honored women who defied emperors, centurions, soldiers to witness to the faith. So on the one hand, we've got this strange opposition to Christianity as being somehow anti-feminist because it's patriarchy. And yet when you look at what it actually does, it has more respect for women. It honors women more than secular liberalism does. And that's why I think, Michael, you were asking about what codes of etiquette are supposed to govern behavior now. Well, ultimately it's chivalry. And that kind of respect for Mary, for women, yes, it was to benefit women, but it was really to perfect men. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And men having lost that or thinking that now women don't deserve chivalry, that's only to their detriment. That's male downfall. Without chivalry, what do men become? Well, the opposite extreme. You get machismo rather than masculinity. You get mm. gangsters, thugs, you get the ghetto, you get family breakdown. And that ultimately is more emasculating. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Yeah, what I struggle a little bit because everything that you just said sounds a lot like woman's empowerment. And so it is Christianity is real woman's empowerment, right? In that way, not feminism in the perverted way that we see it today. But when we go back to the conversation about, well, what, how is it that Islam carries such a heavy masculine hand and it's, or, and it seems as if, we've lost our way, could it be, you know, like I say, I struggle, could it be that it was just a slippery slope and just too much was given, too much was given. Women were raised to too high of a, I don't believe this, but I'm just pondering, is, is this why the door was left open or there was a crack in our armor that allowed us to get where we are right now? Hmm. Elliot, well, who, listen, listen to this by way of, Solution. Now this this is a Catholic guide to marriage uh, that I, I found. It's from 1958. It received the imprimatur from Cardinal Spellman of New York, and this is it's written by Reverend George Kelly. It's on Random House, interestingly enough, but it's got imprimatur, nihil obstat, and everything. It, it and it goes through every aspect of married life, and it's basically just like the case for patriarchy or Steph's, my wife's book. Uh, ask your husband, but it's, it's from a priest. It's got the imprimatur unlike either of our two books. Listen to this passage. The wife should uh, work outside the house only in cases of great necessity. Experience teaches that the path of the working wife is strewn with difficulties, both for herself and her family. All too often the wife who takes a job with a temporary objective, like to buy new furniture, for example, soon discovers that living standards have risen to meet the new, in, uh, the new income, and that the family needs her wages to live on the scale to which it has quickly become accustomed. Once their wives help support the home, some husbands tend to become lazy and to neglect their own duties as providers. Again, this is like, didn't shake any trees when it came out. In other cases, if the wife's income approximates or exceeds that of her husband's, his pride may be deeply wounded and friction may easily develop over the question of who is head of the household. Of course, this is basic. Who's providing the basic material needs, who's furnishing them, will be regarded, rightly or wrongly, as head of the household. Work outside the home may also... What's that? 
on that point today, yeah. based on current research, that is the thing most strongly correlated with divorce. It's the wife out earning the husband. And that's also very highly correlated with male impotence as well. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, <laughs> the reason I, I read this now as a response to you, Elliot, is because when you go through the basics of Christian teaching prior to, it's not even like 1960, it's like 1968, 69, 70 is when second mm -hmm. wave feminism really came in. So this book was uh, ahead of it by 10 or 12 years, which was all very recent second wave feminism. It's all crystal clear that Christianity does not yield too, too much to women. It doesn't yield too, too much. I mean, like, I, I understand what you're saying is the germ there, but it's so clear in scripture. It's like mm -hmm. 10 different passages in New Testament. It's all over the Old Testament. It's all of the first patristics. It's all of the scholastics. Women sinned first. We, we, because of a woman, Eve, we have to die. Why? Because Eve was tricked by a beast. <laughs> you know, a man wouldn't have been tricked but he was standing down. It's a sin of omission on Adam's part. He shouldn't have been letting his wife have all of this um, social intercourse with the world, right? right. The, the wife answers the door and it's a serpent. We all have to die now. Thanks a lot, Adam. Thanks a lot, Eve. Man <laughs> is clearly the head of the household and he, he needs to, to work as his most basic function. He's got more important vocational duties once he gets home from work at the end of the day, but he does need to work because that's most, the most visible sign of being the householder and he's functionally equipped for it besides. And the woman is dependent. This book goes on to say that uh, the worst aspect of women working is that they become economically independent. And this is a, a non-natural thing. It's natural for the woman to depend on her husband. And when you read first Corinthians, Colossians, Timothy, Titus, uh, where are all of them? Of course, Ephesians, Ephesians 5, it's crystal clear that Christianity is not giving too much away to the woman by saying, by establishing this very basic hierarchy. Man is the head. The woman has to submit to him in all things. Elliot, the, the New Testament says this several places. And mm -hmm. I, your question was a good question. I think a lot of people out there have it. It's not that Christianity even flirted with in scripture or tradition. It's never even flirted with anything approaching feminism. It's just that we ignore the teachings. I mean, man, woman has to do everything a man teaches. Some popes added the gloss, except grave sin, you know, but the Bible just says well, a wife has to submit to her husband in all things. That's a direct quote from two or three different passages. Pope yeah. said, okay, if he's, if he's telling you to go kill someone or to miss mass on Sunday, you don't, that's the only place you don't have to listen because it's mortal sin, but there's not much, I'll say there's not anything left to the imagination by Christianity that w the wife of the home is at highest, the first mate, the husband is the captain and the, the captain is a kind of sovereign, even in like international law, the, the captain of a ship out at sea is a kind of uh, practic practical sovereign. And I, I, Elliot, what do you think of this? I recently did a Twitter poll and said, Christians, what is the Christian model of the org chart for the home? Is it more like a ship, husband's captain, and wife is first mate? Or is it more like co-captains of a football team? And I think it was 86% of people gave the right answer, the ship answer, but, but almost no one's fully red-pilled. Most of these guys, even trads I know, don't really believe that yes, your wife is dignified. She's over the children. She's got a, she's fully ego formed adult. She is second in command, but you are first in command. I, I, so I don't know. Does that answer the question some? Does that help the people out there that might be wondering, you think, Elliot? Yeah, I think it's very clear, especially when it comes to scripture and tradition. There's no question about, no question about it. And if we look back prior to, I don't know, the, I don't know how far back does this 
slippery slope of feminism begin to rear its ugly head in the Western culture? I, I'm curious about that. Like, where can we pinpoint that seed that has got us to this massive oak that we're trying to chop down? Mm. The devil, isn't it? The devil's the first feminist. That's the first denial of hierarchy. Yeah. <laughs> All the way I back. Wanna see I want to see where it showed up. Like, what? where did we capitulate? Where... Where was there, what revolution, right? Like, it seems as if every revolution in the West bared breasts. And every time you see revolution, you see a bunch of titties. When did the titties come out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say, look, uh, in, in, you know, I'm, I'm not just trying to plug case for patriarchy here, but I do do a history of feminism. And I say what Will said. I say it's the devil knows that basically the original sin um, of Adam and Eve is a sin by omission of feminism by on Adam's part, sin by commission on Eve's part. Feminism, feminism, the two halves. Man stands down, he has his wife be the leader of the household, and all of us, to quote, to quote Chrysostom, all of us therefore have to die, and he's quoting St. Paul. More specifically, though, the way you're, you're wanting to see the, uh, the, you know, the, the proverbial breasts pop out of the women's revolution, <laughs> Upstate New York, uh, at the convention of Seneca Falls, is when Elizabeth Cady Staunton and others got together in 1860. I think it's in 1860, or is it 1848? 48. 48. Yeah. 48. It's 18. I should know. It's out of my book. So 1848, Mike, you help me answer this. I, literally, they, they get together and they have a, de a declaration of grievances, and it's styled after the Declaration of Independence. And the most profound thing I came up with in my research for Case for Patriarchy that everyone out there should be telling their guys is there are five main takeaways in their declaration. I kind of boiled points down, but those five main points line up with identity, identically with the five main points that um, Kate and Mallory Millett talk about being screamed by the first second wave feminists in a New York City uh, boardroom by a bunch of, of women then. Mm -hmm. And it, they're, they're all of the, the five worst things, you could, you could guess them if you sat around right now. Um, so first wave feminism is really bad and most conservatives just give it a pass. And they say, oh, radical feminism, which is second wave right. feminism, that's what's really bad. So it stole into the interpretive hermeneutical arm of particularly Protestant Christianity between 1848 and 1970 under the guise of non-pernicious first wave feminism. I think that's the historical answer you're after. Mm. Mike, did I miss anything in my answer? And after that, Elliot, you tell us if we answered sufficiently. Uh, yeah, the, the only, I think that's spot on in terms of, yeah, the history of feminism, but I think it goes back even further to points that you've already pointed out. Really, it's, you know, it's the removal of final causality and the correct anthropology of man from the Western mind. So we remove Aristotle, we remove Telos, and no one really knows what they actually are anymore, what their essence is. And then we inhabit some enlightenment version of contractualism, uh, whether it's Lockean or Millian or Hobbesian or, or Rousseau or whatever, right? But that ends up swapping out the Aristotelian, Aristotomist, metaphysics of man and once you get your anthropology of man wrong and anthropology of humankind wrong everything else downstream from that is, go is going to be it's going to be the the one error compounding uh, upon the next so i think even that even further back from seneca falls is this this false anthropology of man that the enlightenment uh has uh, given us what you lose then is the complementarity between yes. man and woman yes. who find their fulfillment in the family together. So yep. they complement each other. The essence of a woman is the potential for motherhood. The essence of a man is the potential for fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Feminism mm. is essentially opposed to that idea. What, you're telling me that my core is a woman? I'm a potential mother? I'm so much more than that. I can kick ass on the battlefield <laughs> in the boardroom. And right. then they basically yeah. start drifting towards these things that are associated with men. And that small mistake that womanhood and motherhood aren't connected ends up ultimately, as you pointed out, Tim, with trans 
feminism opens the door to trans no. and then you see that it's patriarchy for real or this new false patriarchy where the trans women the men say shush now ladies the real women are talking <laughs> it's us. this is this is patriarchy 2.0 didn't you know yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and there, there are two iterations of patriarchies without gender dysphorics leading it. There's there's the true Christianity, and as Michael points out, there's the kind of first false patriarchy that's at least still masculine-ish mm -hmm. in, in a way that the likes of Andrew Tate salutes, and that's that's Islam. And then the third one is this uh, drag show patriarchy where, the, you know, sh ladies sit down. The, the, the ladies of, of uh, Splendor have arrived. And uh, I, I think so there's there's three competing patriarchies and only one corresponds with with uh, telos. That is to say, with the way that men and women were wired. Will you point out complementarity, which which is the the greatest expression of the telos between man and woman? Would you would probably not be surprised to learn that? The first wave feminists, the one that still a bunch of right wingers call non non evil first wave feminists, they were they they said time and time and time again, what we have to get around is this Christian concept of complementarity. We have to because here's what complementarity means. The husband leads, the wife follows. The husband is active, the wife is passive. The husband is expressive. The wife is receptive. All that means complementarity. So there's some feminist that came out with a book. I'm not even going to name her name uh, recently over the last year. And now she's uh, she's a Christian. She's trying to peddle her books to, to Christians. And so she's playing down the feminism, but she's mad at, at gender. The book is hmm. called The Genesis of Gender. And so she's trying to talk against gender theorists like a Christian's mad at them, but really she's a feminist mad at them because the feminists are mad at the, at the, at the you know, drag show trannies who are saying, shush ladies, the real ladies have arrived. And um, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get that feminism, whether you trace it to the 1800s or long before, is just, it's the original transgender, right? Feminism says men and women can act like each other. And this is the original sin in ways we've even showed. Homosexuality came along, you know, in like the 1990s into the public forum, really. And it just says men and women can act like each other in the bedroom. And then a little bit after that, transsexualism, transgenderism comes in and says men and women can ontologically speaking be one another. And the, the most frightful uh, aspect of this morphology from feminism to homosexualism to transgenderism is the collapsing time curve, mm. right? It literally took first wave feminism, which all the cuck conservatives out there says is not bad. It took it from about 1848, if we, if we launch it from the, the Seneca Falls Convention, to about 1950 to, to really cook. So about 10, 10 to the power of two, 100 years to get into the water. If you compare this to its next iteration, homosexualism, just men and women can act like each other, that took from about 1992 or 93 to 2004, 2005, 2006, about 10 years, 10 to the power of one, to start really uh, uh, a, an aggressive regime of propaganda. You start seeing it pop into shows like Frasier and Seinfeld in the mid 90s. And then by 2006, you had Prop 8 in California where it was effective. Um, so that's 10 to the power of one. So feminism took a hundred years to, to marinate. Homosexualism takes about 10 years and then look at its final iteration, the gender swap. It's just feminism. The third order of feminism is transsexualism. Took from all of 2014 to about 2015, maybe 2013, the, the Bruce Jenner stuff comes out. 10 to the power of zero. So you have a speeding up time curve from homosexualism to transgenderism, all because feminism already collapsed the telos and ergon, the function and the purpose of man-woman relations. Man is always the leader inside the family. Woman always needs to follow. It collapsed that, collapsed complementarity. 
it it turned men into cucks. It turned women into wannabe men. They don't do it well. Men don't act like women well. Women don't act like men well. But all the heavy lifting was done from the late 1800s or the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s. And that's why homosexualism and transgenderism could move so fast. What do you guys think of that? Because all the heavy lifting was done. I would ask, where would you place contraception in that slippery slope? Because I know you're not a big fan of E. Michael Jones, but I love the fact that he points out that when we introduce contraception, that's when homosexuality became a thing because by sterilizing us, right? Like transgenderism, I would propose, began with contraception because now you're sterile, having sterile sex that just basically eliminates the the dual nature or the, you know, the, the, the male and female nature because now we are basically just all gay. <laughs> I oh, okay so you're asking me I think I think E Michael Jones is way 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 spot on what, particularly when it comes to gender relations the 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 quelled <laughs> libidinal drives of the I mean I I yeah I, I think I haven't read any of his extensive works but I I got to give credit he said a lot of the things that I later say and without having read any of his stuff um so I respect what he's saying about the libido, you know, and let me also say this, this is what Michael was pointing out, particularly with regard to the sexual functions of male and female, Elliot, this is what you should tell these red pill guys. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know you're coming to us from that convention. Um, it's, it's this, when you deny and I think E. Michael Jones would agree 100% with this. When you deny a organ or a, a system of organs, you know, gastrointestinal system, reproductive system, let's use those two as our models. When you deny what its telos is, what its purpose is, you are destroying not only that system, but the whole human body, qua that system. Um, both the gastrointestinal system, right? And the reproductive system can be used for pleasure, whereby the second a secondary effect of eating or copulating is pleasure can be supl sublimated as the purpose for which you eat. Mm -hmm. Take this to any of the workout the workout crew or anybody who has half a healthy view of food. What if we said? Which is all the contraceptive mindset does, Elliot? That the purpose of food is not giving nutrients to the body, but the purpose of food is pleasure. Yeah. No one wants to buy this lie. Why? Right? Because no one wants to look like a great big fat ass. That's, <laughs> that's the fact. No one likes it because when you contracept or you bear the contraceptive mindset onto nutrition and food, you wear it like a scarlet A, like Hester Prynne, right? You wear it on your, on your lapels. You wear your belly. When you sublimate, the point of food is to give me this amount of energy I need to get through my day and to hopefully to pack on some muscle. When I eat for pleasure only, I, I have too much food usually. That's what the contraceptive mindset has done, the too much sex. And the wrong kind and at the wrong time and in the wrong way, mm. to use the Aristotelian language. So no one wants to be quote unquote contraceptive about their gastrointestinal system, right? The purpose right. of the gastrointestinal system has one goal. It's to break food down, to metabolize food. And yes, it's, it's very fun, particularly on vacation, you note it. Every meal is kind of what you're looking forward to. It's fun to eat. You get pleasure from food. And there, that's not wrong right. as long as, as it's pleasure coextensive to the telos, the goal of what the system does. Eat the right kind of food. Can be, healthy food can be good. Healthy portions can be pleasurable. Right. Then now take that to the contraceptive mindset. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> you, you do that what's the purpose of sex it's to bring new right. life into the world and the the church has always taught this should be done under three fonts it should be marital should be procreative and it should be unitive is it fun hell yes it is yeah that's why catholics have a lot of babies it's a good motivator the pleasure of your next meal even if you're eating healthy portions and, and healthy nutrients in it 
that could be a great motivator to get you to, to the restaurant if you're marching around Disney World like I was with seven little troops and a wife in tow. It's, it's a great motivator, the pleasure, as long as it's running alongside the main goal. But in the West, I totally agree with, with EMJ. We've sublimated the main goal of heterosexual sex, and it's essentially made us all gay. It's essentially made us all transsexual. It's essentially mm-hmm. made us all feminist. And that's what I think this was uh, Will's point from the last like pre-run we did at this. We want you to be telling those guys at that convention, look, contraceptive sex, non-marital sex, premarital sex, heterosexual even, is feminism. It gives in to feminism. And I think E. Michael Jones would say the same. I have some good news just to share very very quickly that one of the observations I made and another Catholic that was at the event uh, said was that for the first time, this event is, it seems as if there is a, a wave of Christianity coming over it. And so to hear these things are becoming more common knowledge in various pockets of the of the manosphere so that's good news nice nice it's very good news. yeah tim just to uh to add on to this this um the, the food analogy I, I guess the the my thought here is where does this um where, where do we f- feature technology into this equation right because now the the speed at which people can get processed foods or the speed at which people can, uh, or the, the society can engage in, in all of these contraceptive uh, uh, vicious features. It, it's, it's laden in, in the entire society in a way that you wouldn't find in a, a more like agrarian uh, type society. So it's like, is it, is, is there something about is there a type of neo-luddism or neo-agrarianism that could help or or at least is implied to combat the the, the, the sort of the unrelenting technology that's that's pushing the promiscuity and the contraception and and the ethic of of culture death um uh fornication you know like i don't know if i'm forming this correctly but i mean no, you see it's, it's sort- spot on yeah. The, on your point of technology, Michael, let's think about porn a bit, because for increasing numbers of young men, porn provides sexual release. It's easy. It doesn't really require you to meet the standard that a real woman would. So it's that obvious form of instant gratification. Mm-hmm. And we've got virtual reality. We've got sex dolls as well. And there's a really <laughs> chilling quote from C.S. Lewis's science fiction trilogy. It's from that hideous strength. And he describes a people who live on the dark side of the moon, an accursed people full of pride and lust. Sound familiar? Hmm. The womb is barren and the marriage is cold. There, when a man takes a maiden in marriage, they do not lie together, but each lies with a cunningly fashioned image of the other, made to move and to be warmed by devilish arts, for real flesh will not please them. They are so dainty, delicate in their dreams of lust. Their real children they fabricate by vile arts in a secret place. And I would argue that actually what we see now is in some ways worse than that, because at least this people on the dark side of the moon are getting married at all Mm -hmm. and at least fabricating kids now what we've got is opposition to marriage and tragically the reason the fertility rate is below replacement is entirely due to abortion if abortion stopped the west europe in particular uk would be above the replacement fertility rate Mm -hmm. so tim's point about sex being for pleasure and children being seen as a burden and interference with the individual's autonomy and being free, whatever that means. That's what it's all about. And technology has enabled it. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Also, there's, there's the basic Heideggerian point that technology alienates from being. And it, it sounds really abstruse, but it reduces to essentially this. I, I remember 
I don't know exactly how this bears on romance and complementarity in the way that men and women relate to each other, but if technology alienates human beings from existence writ large, then it's sure to alienate us from real existence one and the other. I remember um, at, when I was engaged to be married, um, Steph and I were at my parents' house. We were actually house sitting for them. And they, they asked us, hey, would you mind, we'll pay you guys. Would you do this stuff? It was a bunch of yard work. So it was similar to agrarianism. They didn't, my parents aren't farmers, but um, they asked us to do a bunch of stuff. Hey, the, the two days of this weekend, would you work on this? We'll, we'll pay you this. And it's like, we're out there in the yard all day, laying down, laying, uh, doing landscaping, laying down soil. They had a pool, you know, we just lived, uh, we, were, we were going to live in an apartment at the time and we were living far away from each other. So it was nice to be near each other. It enabled us, I think like a month before we got married to play house uh, a, a little bit and to see what it was like. And to be out there working in the fields, which is the experience of so many human beings throughout the, the centuries with their wives, working in not maybe not inside the home, but in the curtilage of their home, which is why all the popes say wives can actually help their husbands in either the shop or in the curtilage of their homes. They shouldn't work outside the home, but they should work near it. Mm -hmm. It was so natural and it was so enticing i remember this day as one of my my favorite days of anticipation during that period known as the engagement that um i felt so connected and it, it sounds corny or something like that because we weren't actually farming but it was like connected with the land we went out and had like a lemonade by the pool after we'd done hours of labor together we were laughing we were joking we we're in the hot bakersfield sun in the desert it was beautiful you felt connected with being Compare that with the impotence. Uh, the Simpsons makes a joke about like the shriveled genitals of the average TV viewer. You're just in there looking at a screen. You're not paying attention to each other. It makes you interact less. And this holds, I, I'd imagine, for, for folks that aren't even courting a woman or engaged to a woman as well. You can get the, the porn and become a cuck. You can get, you can, you can, you know, in the 90s, they had 1-900 numbers. Remember those? You become yeah. a cuck. You're not having to be a good man to attract a good woman or to sustain the attraction of a good woman and, and vice versa. It alienates us. I wonder, you know, I hear you talking about being out in the uh, you know, garden working and being outdoors. I myself have picked up from the stadium living out in rural Florida. And then the Benedict option idea that perhaps Benedict had the right idea when the Rome was crumbling and the men picked up and started monasteries. I, 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 I question though, of course, there's a natural inclination towards that. There's a draw towards that, I guess, because it's in our DNA, but do we, to how do we disengage, but stay fully engaged? And even if that's necessary, I struggle with that. Do we do we remove ourselves because we are called to set ourselves apart? And that's a good idea. But at the same time, well, can we ever truly be apart? Like here we are, you know, miles away from one another, engaging in this cloud like behavior. Do we give that up? And then what virtue is there in that as well? Mm -hmm. yeah. well it's in the world, but not of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean. That, that's, that's the key, is we, we have a direct command from Jesus to, to be in the world, not of it. For, for me, Elliot, for you, for, for, for Will, it's like, hey, I mean, this is a great, this is a great way to maybe give some, some young guys out there a fighting shot that we didn't really have. I mean, all of us are similar ages. And so in the 90s, it's like the MTV generation Mike talks about this in uh, Don't Go to College. Things got really gnarly with the, 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 the libertinism that was just presumed. You know, it didn't matter whether you went to a Catholic school. There was no yeah. one out there saying anything red-pilled. And I think this is why Andrew Tate and the like have such a devoted following. Mm -hmm. There's no one pushing back against feminism. I remember being in seventh grade, being the best basketball player on the boys' team, and, and my, my English teacher said like, oh, 
everyone talks about uh, you, Tim Gordon. I'll, I'll bet you this this young young girl, the best on the girls team can can beat you. And I was so offended. I was so offended because she played PE with us and she couldn't even hang with like the worst boys, of course. <laughs> and and I but I didn't know I could say that. There was no one sticking up for our part in the 90s. And so the podcast culture, which is the bright side of technology. Yeah. The podcast culture is practically salvific um, when it comes to the uh, not to go full E. Michael Jones on this, but there's there is a monopoly on the mainstream airwaves. There's a monopoly on the mainstream radio waves um, controlling what what goes in and out like a tight input output machine. And the internet and podcasts have broken that. Most people get their news from podcasts now. And that, yeah, that's the absolute silver lining in the technology cloud, no pun intended, mm -hmm. which even though it can alienate us from being, what we're trying to do with this C-Mask podcast, Christian Masculinism, is to put our elbows out to get some space you're actually doing it in, in actual physical space, Elliot. It's funny timing that you're there, the, the first one of these that we do. But we're trying to put our elbows out and earn some space for Christianity back in the middle of the pushback against feminism. Feminism is what the modern left, what Marxism, neo-Marxism, any future strains of anti-Christianity is always based in feminism. It's the original sin. Hopefully we've can, uh, shown that it is constituted by original sin. Mm -hmm. And um, and to say, hey, there is something. Can we close just by talking about we're, we're edging out the, the, the red-pilled guys, conceptually anyway, uh, by saying, look, you fall short here. Promiscuity is feminism. You give in to the feminists. Mm -hmm. You give in to the feminists because you have no power unless you have a family of your own. You have no headship unless you're the head of a family uh, on your own. But also on the other side, those that we're edging out are all of the Christians. I'm talking Catholics, Protestants. I don't really know Orthodox. They're less in the public space. But as far as anyone can discern, the Christians are the, the ones that just stood down to all the feminists and said, you know, whether they're traditional or, or more liberal Christians, they all pretty much stood down to the wave of feminism. And they seem to have just said, look, this is an inevitability. We have to, we have to give the rights up to the women. We have to stop reading Ephesians 5, 21 to 24 at church, even when it's the reading once every two years. We, we have to bracket it. Did you know that it's bracketed in the missile? You know, they say you don't even have to read this, even though it's, it's on the liturgical calendar to be read. Christians did this nerdy, blue-pilled, Ned Flanders Christians, the same ones that say no Christian should ever have been in a fight, the same ones that refuse to emphasize that Christian men should be strong physically and own guns and be capable of protecting their family and should be capable of protecting Holy Mother Church. Even Pope Francis says you should poke someone in the nose if they make fun of your mother, the church. I like that. It's like the one thing he said that I like. So the mainstream Christianity, I even include a lot of traditional Christians in this, have just stood down to feminism. So we're edging them out on the right side, edging out the, the red pill, uh, uh, you know, red pill um, man. Homosexuals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. The what red do you guys say about homosexuals. That? That's who they are. <laughs> <laughs> It is uh, it. It. The, the, the disco. Yeah. <laughs> in the yeah, disco. Yeah, yeah. America's a gay <laughs> disco. Yeah, Tim, that's just uh it just reminded me just growing up in the nineties or the eighties and nineties that just this ethic amongst the, the Christian, the older Christian men in the community I was in. There was always this ethic of, hey, you you respect women. And it's just like respect took the took the form right. of I uh, just just roll, just be a doormat, right? Where it's just like Wait a second. Like, there's a, there's going to be a corresponding. There's no there was respect, but no regard for your own authority. Like that was, and that was the Ned Flanders Catholicism that you, you and your brother explained. But isn't that uh, unbiblical, right? Like, it doesn't. It's it's actually an inversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's you've been taught 
to respect women, respect women, respect women. But in the Bible, it says, respect your husband, respect, mm, <laughs> respect yeah. the man, respect yeah. the head of your household. It says, love your women. So it's like this mantra has been beat into our heads. Here's, you know, I'm always thinking solutions, right? That's what guys do. And I'm like, well, okay, we got to figure out the problem. And the problem is that we've allowed the enemy to educate us. We're mm -hmm. watching their media. We're sending our kids to their schools and they're pounding this crap into our heads. Christian or not, you're going to believe respect women. And that's a big part of how we've gotten here. Yeah, Elliot, are you the one that pointed that out to me? I think you are. That, that what's scriptural is husbands, this is later in Ephesians. It's not the point I'm always harping about. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. I think you're the first guy that pointed that out to me. It's something yeah. I'd overlooked with all my New Testament uh, 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 figurings. That's really, really important. Respect women. It's like, well, it, it doesn't mean that we're, one should bear a respectful posture toward mm -hmm. his wife, but the respect actually usually involves headship. And so there's right. a, there's mm -hmm. a tacit, there's a hook in there that you were being taught to respect women as if they're the head of the household. So you, I, I think I, I have you to thank for that. Cause you're, I think the first person that pointed that out to me after I'd written case for patriarchy. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think what we should say is, okay, if we edge out the nerdy Christian Ned Flanders guys, who is that? It's like everyone. It's like everyone. And this is a, a point I just want to hit. It's, it's, it's a personal thing to harp on. In the trad Christian world, in the mainstream Christian world, I can only imagine in the left Christian world, it's all the same story. It's all the same story. Is that Feminism took over the church in the world, and it is the main force to contend with. I mean, like literally... What the left does so well is it makes you defend one of their talking points from two or three generations ago by pitting it false opposition against their newest talking point from this generation. Look at the, the best example of this. Um, you get even, I, I think there are even Daily Wire guys, maybe not. I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but lots of conservatives defending women's sports against the transgenders in women's sports. And, and me, I say, why would you do that? You just rolled over and died and they started defending women's sports. It's in Agenda 2030, by the way. They're pushing it really hard. Women's sports is feminism, the original transgender. They just tricked you into defending <laughs> women's sports against the, the, the trannies. And the main thing you should do is say, I don't like any of these groups. But feminism is the most noxious. And I guess this means that if trannies are showing women how bad they are at sports, that's the silver lining in the transsexual playbook. And I'll take it. I'm not going to defend that. But you get a bunch of conservatives that fall for this principle every time. The left is genius. They appear to be playing 4D chess, getting us to defend their own position from 1970. Why should we not defend our position, the conservative, the Christian position from 1970, which is we don't want women in military combat, in sports, in positions of leadership in general. Men want to hear that, don't they? Yeah, and that's Michael's equal rights point to come back to the beginning. Equal rights means equal fights, and people don't want that. They know intuitively that it's wrong. It's worse for a man to hit a woman than to hit a weaker man. People have a instinctive revulsion to male on female violence. And that's the ultimate endpoint of the equal rights, isn't it? The equal fights, female conscription. That's where we're going. It's, yeah. uh, they expose how bad their ideas are with regard to how, um, you know, how much they have to prop up their unpopular or their, or their seemingly uh, virtuous but unpopular ideas like take for example women's sports once again why is it that they have to continuously bail out the wnba all right mm -hmm. is are we not equal should they not earn their own money and pay their own way it's right. not about equality it's about superiority it's about inversion that's right that's no. right yeah, 20 27 years out of 27 they've been in the in the red and you get like one nba player that's crazy enough to bespeak the truth. It's Draymond Green. That's like, 
Why should we bail them out? Wait, uh, even more than that, Elliot, why should there be a WNBA, right? If you believe in equality, if you're deluded enough to believe in male, female <laughs> equality, why can't women just play in the NBA? Right. Well, transgenderism is going to fix this. I, I can't wait yeah. for LeBron to become a woman and then just just own the W. Th then I would watch, right? You know, so th this will <laughs> this will solve itself, right? Sports yeah. will just become the A team and B team that, of of men. That that's just the the logic of transgenderism is going to solve this this issue, Tim. If you if you run it long enough, it would. Except the left seems to play such 4d chess that they're they're correcting that as we speak yeah <laughs> they don't just want men fighting women in uh the ufc i mean they, they put them on all the the higher undercards these perverse matches women versus women have you guys seen i mean like they keep them hermetically separated while joined it's like separate the left separate but equal is the woman's sports thing it's like just make this chick fight this dude I like how it, the transgender, I, I don't want to see any woman get hurt, but I like how the transgender men, everyone tacitly has to acknowledge, well, this man is going to destroy the woman contra every Marvel movie where a woman's kicking in doors and kicking men across the room. I like that, mm. that even the left has to defer doff of the cap to nature when it comes to UFC, that, that dude's going to kill her, you know, like that, keep them, keep them separate. But I, what I don't like to see, I think I tweeted this at Cernovich once. Um, I was like, why are you talking about the, the women's undercards? This is disgusting. It's vile. What, what do you guys think when you see oh, a couple of women fighting each other on those UFC undercards? Now they're putting them in the, the boxing matches. Tonight we got Deontay Wilder. And um, I wonder if there's going to be a, a female undercard boxing match. I'm sick of it. Can, can we talk in a future episode about feminism in ancient Rome? So before Christianity was in the ascendancy, what Rome looked like and putting women in the Colosseum and female mm. blood sports, because mm. there are some really strong parallels between what we're seeing now in a, a pagan culture, mm. ultimately, and disrespect of women. Because anyone listening, thinking that what we've said is misogyny, Feminism is the real misogyny because it says that the only way a woman can be valuable is by acting like a man. Hence, the female Marvel movies have got them with muscles beating people up because that is what we're supposed to admire. Yeah, you can't be feminine and be a hero, you can't be like Mary and be a hero. That is beneath respect, it's beneath dignity. Only the male model of action is acceptable. So feminism is misogyny on the deepest level. Mm, yeah, that's good. And when you say they have muscles, well, you mean like little chick, like Drew Brees guns, right? Like Natalie Portman in the newest thing. I was like, she's got little like Drew Brees guns. That's not, <laughs> those are, they're not real muscles anyway. They're, they're, I mean, here's the ultimate proof. When a woman gets quote unquote strong for the Olympics, what happens? Their cycles stop that makes mm. them less mm. fertile. When a man gets strong, it makes him more fertile, right? Testosterone spikes. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so that's the ultimate proof. That's all you need. It's, it's the science, trust the science. The stronger a woman gets, she's never gonna be strong like a man, never gonna have the muscle fiber of a man. But when she does get those odd little Drew Brees chick guns, you know, on her muscles, they, it, it always stops the cycle. That's horrible. Why can't we just trust the science? Science is a social construct of the patriarchy, Tim. I'm not sure if you uh, <laughs> uh, you got the memo, but uh, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Just what I'm here yeah. for. Yeah, when it was funny when when uh, Mike earlier you were saying like it was Mike or Will, you were like, look, we we got all these evils. We got uh, contraception. We got porn. We have sex dolls. I was like. I want people to know it's not like we, us, we, we don't got, I was going to say you got them. <laughs> um, uh, how can we, how can we drive the point home by way of closing for the young men out there listening that are not necessarily Christian masculinists yet. I think this is a backroads to evangelization. Then maybe they're just, they're masculinists and they were at the, the 21 convention that Elliot was just at, um, that just spoke at 
Like, how can we, how can we say, come on over to our side, man. If you want to be masculine, there's only one way. You got to follow the king. Uh, there's only one true version of patriarchy and it's Christianity. Now, how can we, how can we close with that? Because the titular suggestion of this video is, it's a big claim, right? The, the title of this video is a big claim. We don't need the effeminate or gay bishops to do anything as Catholics. Uh, we, we all want the Latin mass, but we don't even need the Latin mass. We don't need our parish priest to say anything. We don't need the Pope to write anything. We can take back Western civilization right now. This sounds like a bad motivational sports speech, but it's true. Men, marry young, marry good women, be good men, lead your family, uh, multiply. And it doesn't really matter when this happens for you, no matter what insist on patriarchal rule over your little fiefdom, which is your family. Be good. It doesn't matter. You know, try, try to get married young. Elliot married his high school girlfriend. I met my wife as she graduated high school, but I didn't get married till after college. Lots, the timing doesn't matter, even though we emphasize the timing. What matters is the culture that the timing suggests. Like, we could take back Western civilization by doing this. Andrew Tate cannot. Andrew Tate, by having, he always talks about his beautiful girlfriend. It's probably a different chick every time. I don't really know. Maybe not. He's not taking back anything. And he's not heading any family. And he's making no cultural change. And ultimately, making it worse. It's cucked. He's making it worse. Can we just end with that? With a, maybe a parting shot from each of you on, on that note? Yeah, don't I, trust a guy in leopard print loafers. That's one <laughs> thing. And then also, look at the ghetto. <laughs> is taking this social experiment further than anywhere else in the world. It's the first society which has been built on promiscuity or as close as you can get to it. And what does removing fathers from the home look like for children, for women and for men? It's social chaos and it strengthens the welfare state and just emasculates men more than anything else that's been tried. So do you wanna take another step down that road or realize that you're heading down a dead end turn around and get on the real road. Amen. How about you? Uh, how about you, Elliot? You want to, you want to give a, a parting shot here? To be honest, I'm thankful for Tate. I think what he's doing is opening up a can of worms that of course, maybe he can't contain, but needs to be smashed open. And in the same way that they say you give people what they think they want or you give people what they want and you give them what they need it's just like he's the he represents the, the the candy that you hide the medicine inside and if we're over here preaching you know catholicism and, and patriarchy and you know all these chastity and all these difficult things that ultimately are the medicine it is what's needed i don't think we can reach people <laughs> as easily and mm -hmm. so I just have to, you know, I'm throwing my two cents in that, like, I appreciate Tate for his ability to get even a semblance of what we're trying to offer into the masses. That do try that, like someone who's trying to live a life only on candy, they start to realize, oh, shit, I'm dying. This is I'm getting diabetes. I'm getting diabetes. Once they do try it and they realize, well, it tastes good. It satisfies all my carnal desires, but ultimately it's fruitless they'll understand or be more receptive to the responsibility that comes with it, uh, the, 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 bitter, the bitter sweetness that comes with it. And so having guys like yourself and this crew that we're putting together uh, to disseminate that information or to have that, to have that net to catch them when they fall is critical. And so I, God has his divine plan and I think it's just unfolding perfectly. How about you, Mike? Uh, so what I was thinking about when I when I posted to, to broadcast on Twitter about this this podcast, I put um, "Pro Deo Family uh, Patria," and uh, you know, for God, family and country. So the you know the the etymology of, of country it, it is patria. It, it is father. So. I would just say for anybody that has any 
any man that it, like it is it is proper and natural for a man to 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 care and immensely about his country so and that that is derivative of of family and ultimately of subordination to god and to christ but the this idea of the connection between country and fatherhood and patriarchy i think is a uh, is an important one so i think if anybody any young man that has you know, just 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 pride in in, in his country and and the sense of of duty to it uh, should recognize the connection the the tight connection between that and and fathers and 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 patriarchy. Beautiful, yeah. For my for my own partying shot, I, I'm having an in and out black square. I don't know if that's a warning, that's a warning or or my cannon is just uh, trying trying to make me salute. Black Lives Matter or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. I'll, I'll finish just by saying I, I'm really energized by what Elliot said uh, in his parting shot. So I'm just going to piggyback on that as gay as that is. Uh, I, I really do think that Andrew Tate has gotten something started. And, and the guys before him, Roosh V before him, you got the Fresh and Fit podcast now. There are in really, really approximate ways that are really, really wrong in lots of other ways. There is significant pushback against feminism happening now. And it is in, in some sense showing through what, what these young disenfranchised men want, what they need. And what they need is Christian masculinism. And that's what we're here for, to clean it up. So to clean up all of the the edges that are wrong. God writes straight in crooked lines or whatever. And yeah, I think he's even writing straight by putting Andrew Tate in the news so much. So we will be here, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades, uh, on one of our four channels, uh, basically once a week, if we can work this out, Christian masculine specific themed podcasts. Thanks for watching today. Definitely Tune in because Rules for Retrogrades is back. I'll be doing three shows a week. I'll, I'll be starting a new, uh, uh, a new benefit for patrons leading up to Halloween, which will be a, a watching club, Stranger Things. So stay posted for that next week. Elliot, Will, and Michael, thank you guys for being here today. God bless you all. And uh, I think this is going to be really fruitful. Deus Volt. And here I am back to say goodbye. <laughs> no more Black Square.